Okay. So welcome to our March 20 um, Camino Wildlife Habitat project. Uh, we were, I think that um, in 2020, in March, we were going to do our bird collision, our window collision program. So two years later, we finally uh, will get to do it. So thank you, Hannah, for um, being willing to, to do it over Zoom. And before I, um, we start the program, let me give you a little spiel about the Canada Wildlife Habitat Project. We do these programs the third Wednesday of the month, and we've been doing them since uh, January of 2003. So we're in our 20th year of programs to help the Camino Wildlife Habitat Project let people know about what they can do in their yards beyond just, um, you know, um, well, doing things in our yards to help wildlife. Actually, if we do things we, together, we're linking and it becomes a bigger deal. So on Camino, we're working to create an island in harmony with nature one yard at a time. And so we're, this is the reason why we want to do it, or, or the people that we're, Roxy and I are working with, the Habitat Project, because rather than um, sobbing when the logging trucks roll off the island, this is our action step. It's a community action step. And all those green spaces that we're losing, if we do things in our own backyards and link corridors by linking our backyards, then we are adding greenery and adding habitat and the picture won't look so bleak. So it's a simple thing to do and this is my yard and at the top is what it was in um, 1995 when we moved in and then the one on, underneath the snowy picture is about 2007 and then the picture to the right is currently what it would look like on a, on a more of a spring day than today right i guess it's not spring until next week anyway so it we did it in pieces it wasn't like you just turn it into a backyard wildlife habitat all at once it's a work in progress and it's always an ongoing thing but it's sure refreshing to go up in our yard when um before it was just grass and it's west facing and really quite hot in the summer. So now our neighbors are, have really hot yards, but ours is full of greenery. We've got it in layers. So there's ground cover, there's shrubs and there's trees. And so that helps the various um, critters in, in whatever elevation level they prefer. And so it's, it's a simple thing to do by providing food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. And the food, the shelter, and the places to raise young uh, is pretty much done with the plants we choose. We don't have to add any supplementary things, but we can do it with the plants. Even the water, um, you know, the, the water can get held into the leaves and that allows little um, drip zones for, for the smaller uh, critters or insects. I know I saw a frog and a great big leaf going for a little puddle at where the leaf came together. Um, near the stem and so it, it's thinking you know what we put in our yard versus having lawn and a tree and that's sterile environment so this is a way to um, enjoy our yards as well as provide for the critters and there's also things to think about as far as responsible uh, responsible gardening and responsible landscaping especially on the island when our, basically our st storm water runoff goes straight into Puget Sound. So what we do in our yards really makes a difference as far as containing the runoff. If we have more plants and we do various things, then we can keep it from just running off into the bay. And so reducing lawn, using natives. It also helps with water conservation because we're an island with a single source aquifer, which means that everything, all our drinking water is in the ground and whatever we put in the ground is what we are pulling up to drink later on. So what we do matters to the health of the critters as well as to the health of ourselves. So that's where we can think about the pesticide and fertilizer use and that as well. And so the salmonscaping is our way of thinking, okay, um, what I'm doing in my yard, if I want to attract the birds, if I want to attract the butterflies, um, then I, I need to be more responsible with what I'm doing with my plants. And so to be certified as a backyard wildlife habitat, it's a simple application. You can find this application 
on our website. And this one you send directly to Friends of Camino Island Parks, which sponsors our Camino Wildlife Habitat project. And it's a simple check off on how you provide food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. And you only need a couple of things in each category. You need three for food and only one for water. So it kind of balances out. And the sustainable gardening it has that whole list of things you can do, noting that, you know, you don't have to be a purist right away, but when you are a wildlife habitat and, and part of the joy of certifying is you're more conscientious about the things you do, the plants you choose, what you're doing in the yard. And, you know, if you're putting up a bird feeder, you're going to think about cleaning the bird feeder or not putting it too close to the window so it doesn't, you know, Provide, uh, lead to accidents. So it makes us more conscientious. So that's a big um, part of the certification is just helping us remember what we're doing and also feeling a part of something. So part of that feeling a part of something is people put up signs and the signs are nice because they kind of let you say, okay, my yard might be a little bit messy. It's messy. Um, now because I'm leaving the seeds and I'm leaving things for habitat and so I, I have a brush pile because I want the critters to have a, some shelter and so or a, some space to raise their young. So the habitat signs are ways to kind of authenticate your little bit of a mess if it's people think it's messy as well as it's great advertising. People call me up and ask how they can certify their yard as a wildlife habitat because they see the signs. The sign on the left is our special sign for the island and you can uh, get that from me once you're certified. So if I know your number and know that you're certified, then I can meet you at Terry's Corner at the park and ride and, and get you a sign. It's $15 or you can get the one directly from the National Wildlife Federation, which certifies. Oh, and um, if you don't certify with our application, if, and if you don't live on Kameno, you can go directly online and certify and um, and do it that way. We'd like to have people send our application in, which is the same as the wildlife habit, as the National Wildlife Federation, they're, they're certifying. Uh, but this way we can count. And right now we have 1,010 certified wildlife habitats on Kameno. So that's very cool. And there, those are some of our dots. We have more dots than that. That's at about 700. So we have about 300 more dots, but you can see how the yards can link up and they can link up to the parks and it restores corridors. And these are all the other communities in Washington that are doing it. Kamena was the second and there are now, I think it's 18. And there are 147 in the nation and Kamena was the 10th. So it's an action step. You can see that the Puget Sound region is, is really one of the, um, the strongest community wildlife habitat areas in the country. And so it, it's feeling like we're part of something. It's an action step. And it's, it's certainly a way to do something rather than feeling frustrated when uh, laws and regulations are allowing more development than is really helping the critters. So for more information, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation website, as well as ours. Roxy's done a wonderful job with our website, and um, it, it's, it's fun to just go plink around in it. And the National Wildlife Federation as well. They've got a lot of stuff on native plants, and you can get more information at the Native Plant Society as well. And here are some books. The Living with Wildlife, Landscaping for Wildlife are both written by Russell Link, who is a wildlife biologist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife in Washington. So they're specific for Washington. Russell Link lives on Whidbey. And then the one on the bottom is the National Wildlife Federation's Wildlife Habitat book. And with that, I want to thank you for listening to my spiel. If you've heard it too many times, then um, spread it to your neighbors because our job is to help the critters and get more wildlife habitat on the island. And with that, I will um, let you know about uh, of our programs. Roxy set it up so that they're recorded and you can go back and look things over. And the one that was in February is worth going to take a look at now because it was baby season is coming and right now um, baby season is coming up so it gives a lot of tips on how we can be responsible of what we're doing in our yards and maybe not being so into cleaning up I know 
for us, we, um, my husband found a, a, a towing nest in the sword fern once when he, one spring when he was trying to clean things up. And it's like a lot of um, the nesting birds are ground nesters. So we have to be real careful with what we're doing. And so that Shona um, Aitken from the Wolf Hollow Wildlife Rehab Center uh, in the San Juans came and gave us talk, but you can go and look that over and it's, and it's an excellent um, refresher of how to be more courteous to the critters in the springtime. And then in March, this is March, in April, we will have a native plants uh, program and it's Native Plant Appreciation Month. And so we have a survey to see what kind of things about native plants you're most interested in. We have had numerous new native plant programs and they're quite popular. So Brenda Cunningham thought it would be kind of nice to see what people really want. So if you go to our website, to our programs page, there's a link to get to the survey and we'll have that survey up till March 20th and then pass that information on to Brenda so she can plan our April 20th program. And with that, I am going to stop chatting about our project and introduce Hana. So Hana is, um, well, she was born on Earth Day and it's just in her blood to, um, to work and help the environment. That's, that's her calling. And I guess it's because of the day she was born. I don't know. But anyway, she is, has been with the Seattle Audubon since 2010. And she's been the education manager since 20, 2015. And with that, she has, um, has this calling she, that, that she wants to let, um, to help with biodiversity and with the critters as well, and to help the youth understand that. And that will help protect the, this is my adding, help protect the planet because all the kiddos are more caring about that. So Hannah is going, to, she has also has a master in education from the UW. So with that, if I missed anything, Hanna, please fill in the blanks. And we're so glad that you're here. We've been wanting to have the, this program for a long time. So we're so glad that you're able to do it for us tonight. So welcome and thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. All right, can I get a thumbs up? If you see the space needle, excellent. Okay. I see it. Yep. Um, Awesome, thank you for having me. So yes, my name is Hannah Bettencourt. I'm the education manager um, at Seattle Audubon. Um, and uh, window collisions and sort of the things that folks can do about this is one of the biggest um, uh, initiatives that Seattle Audubon is tackling at the moment. So I am really happy to share this information with you today. This is sort of the thing that I've been working on a lot. A lot of my time is spent on teaching people about windows. So. Um, before uh, we get into that, I just want to go over, just want to give you a little info about Seattle Audubon. Um, we are one of 25 different local chapters in the state of Washington. Um, Kameno, your local chapter is Skagit Audubon. Um, and so Seattle Audubon has been around since 1916. We were founded as the first environmental nonprofit in Washington state. And our first initiative was the fight against the international feather trade. So that was our first conservation mission. Um, and then since then, we've done work to protect specific species like the northern spotted owl or the marbled murrelet. Um, we've also done um, consumer related issues like shade grown coffee which protect migratory birds like the Western tanager. Um, and our current work focuses on both urban birds and people. Since we, you know, our, our service area is really, really urban. We are, our service area is Seattle for the most part. So um, we really believe that the things that are good for birds are actually also really good for people. So we're sort of trying to combine um, the best of both worlds. And so, um, and so this is, this is one of those things that we're working on. So. Anna, can you turn off the volume, your volume? I think you're a little low. Um, if that's not possible, that's maybe we can all just turn our volumes up. I'm having a little can trouble. Can you hear me some... better now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe it was I think just, it was just, okay. it was just this. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so this leads me to our current um, initiative, which is our Bird Safe Cities initiative. Um, and so the main goals of this are habitat enhancement, which I know I'm speaking to the right crowd about this, um, 
and hazard reduction. So um, habitat enhancement work includes work to promote native plantings, um, maintain our urban forests, and um, with the goal of increasing that connectivity of habitat across the city. Um, and then if you're going to welcome more birds and more critters into your yard and into our spaces, it's going to be really important to make sure that those spaces are safe for those birds and those in that wildlife. And so that's where hazard reduction comes into play. So um, the two main goals of hazard reduction that we're really promoting are window collisions. So um, helping with window collisions and uh, reduction of rodenticide or rat bait use. All right, so let's talk about glass. Um, so windows and the negative effects that it has on bird populations across North America um, really does, it's really considered a conservation threat. Um, so the current statistic <laughs> is that between 400 million and a billion birds um, die from window collisions each year in the United States. Um, and this statistics makes windows the second leading cause of death, um, the human related cause of death for birds in the country. And that's second only to free roaming and domestic cats. Um, cats kill 2.4 billion a year. Fun fact, not so fun fact. Um, so in any case, um, we can say that, you know, whether it's 400 million or a billion, it's not a small number of birds, um, which, makes, uh, which makes the work to make windows safer for birds even more important. So the biggest reason that windows are an issue for birds is not necessarily because they are see-through and birds think they can fly through them, although that can be an issue, especially if you have a lot of vegetation on the other side of a window. Um, but it's more due to the fact that windows are very reflective. And um, birds have a relatively narrow uh, um, depth perception. And so they have a really hard time distinguishing between reflection and reality. So this is what a bird would see when they are near a window. It is, to us, it's probably pretty obvious that this is a reflection from a window, but to a bird, it's just a whole lot more green and where they normally would land. Um, this is actually my window at my house and it did kill a bird in spring of 2020. And I have since um, made some changes to this window and we haven't had any issues since. And we'll talk about what I did in a minute. Okay, so um, I think folks generally have an idea that birds um, hitting windows is a problem. I think what folks don't realize is how much bird feeders and other habitat elements that welcome birds into our yards actually exacerbates the problem. Um, and this is just simply due to the fact that when you have more birds near a window, more of them are more likely to hit it. So um, I want you all to think to yourself, if you have a bird feeder, one, and if you do have a bird feeder, where is that bird feeder in relation to the nearest window? So how far apart is that bird feeder from the nearest window? And I think for the most part, you're going to find that it's between three or 30 feet of a window, because that's generally how big our yards are, unless we're lucky enough to have nice large yards, which you might on the island, I don't know. Um, and so the general um, thinking is that actually bird feeders are best placed either very close to a window, so within three feet of a window, or much further than the window, over 30 feet, so over 10 meters away from that window. And I think the, it seems a little bit counterintuitive to bring that, win, bring that feeder really close to the window, but the idea behind this is that when it's right up against the window, that the bird doesn't have enough momentum to hit the window and in a way that will injure them. Um, so bringing it really close or bringing it really far is the best way to deal with uh, the, the feeder situation. Okay, so if, if we're looking to fix the problem of window collisions, it's really important to understand it a little bit better. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more background on who these birds are that are hitting our windows. Um, so this is the intake data from Paws Wildlife that we, re that we received a couple of years ago. Um, and this is their intake data of all window collision patients 
between 2009 and 2019. And um, they had 1,100 intakes total within that 10 year span. And if you look at the graph, it's an overwhelming majority of them, over almost 900 of those 1,100 birds are the non corvid songbirds, are the friends that we normally see in our yard flitting around in our bushes, um, followed by raptors, then doves, then corvids, which are your crows and jays, and then waterfowl and gulls. Um, it's important to remember that though 1100 doesn't seem like a huge number of birds over the course of 10 years, um, this is, these, are all, these are only the birds that didn't die on impact and were brought in by a human who found them. Um, and so it's, I think it's safe to say that many more birds in the Seattle area likely hit windows undetected by people. All right, so um, of so these 1,100 birds that were brought to pause um, represent 84 different bird species. So really, it's pretty indiscriminate as far as who um, is a victim of a window collision. Um, and this is and 84 species is about half the bird species that are regularly seen in the Seattle area. Now, what's really interesting is that if you look at the top 10 species of birds that were um, brought into the hospital. There are only 10 of them um, and they make up 50% of the bird species, of the birds that hit windows. Um, so you have your typical friends like the dark-eyed junco, your Anna's hummingbird, uh, northern flicker, pigeon, pine siskin, and golden crown kinglet. So these are some pretty common birds that I think most of us are um, used to seeing in our yards. Um, however, all four thrushes are also listed in the top 10 as well. Um, so you have your varied thrush on the right, um, the, and then you have your robin, and then a hermit thrush and Swainson's thrush. So all four species of thrush that we normally see in our area made the top 10. Um, so thrush species actually make up 20% of all the collision patients brought to pause. So for some reason, um, thrushes are particularly susceptible for window collisions. And we unfortunately don't have very much data to explain why. So we actually need more data. Um, so let's take uh, a second to consider the varied thrush. Um, if you are not familiar with this lovely bird, it is a cousin of the robin. It's similar in shape, similar in color. Um, and they are a common visitor to the Seattle area, probably to Camino as well, um, especially in the wintertime. They are higher alpine birds um, and they come down um, in the wintertime and then they often go back up. Usually about now they're starting to head back up um, into the mountains. And unfortunately, populations of varied thrush have seen a 73% decline in the last 50 years. Um, most of that is probably likely to habitat loss. So, um, have, thrushes really depend on mature coniferous forests to thrive, and those are, those are getting cut down uh, pretty regularly for development and, and other purposes. Um, however, so, you know, because they're losing their habitat, they're being forced to live um, in more human inhabited places, in more urban areas, and to become a victim of a window collision as regularly as they do is not going to help with um, uh, with their population decline. All right, so here's another representation of the data from PAWS. So this um, divides up the intakes by month. So you'll notice that collisions are an issue year round. However, um, you'll notice that they nearly double during peak migration season between June and October. So we're seeing a lot more collisions and this, these collisions happen a lot more across the country. So it is during these times that you will see these horrific um, uh, headlines. So, um, you know, 1000 birds crashing into Philadelphia overnight or the uh, picture on the right is an image from this past September from New York City Audubon. And um, they had an incident, I think on September 14th where they had 250 birds die in one night um, hitting the World Trade Center Freedom Tower. 
So, um, so the bright, so the, the reason that we see these happening, especially during migration season, is not because these birds are living in these cities. It's because they're migrating over these cities um, and at night. A lot of these birds, most of these birds are actually nighttime migrators and they are very attracted to lights. And so when they are flying over a large metropolitan city with lots of lights coming down from the high rises from the city, they're going to be attracted to it. And oftentimes they fly in and they get disoriented, they get lost. And when first light comes up and, um, and reflects against the windows, that's when the window collisions often are occurring. Um, and so things that, you know, Seattle Audubon advocates and has been advocating for years on lights out programs, turning lights off, dimming lights, um, turning even half the lights off of a skyscraper can, can drastically reduce the number of birds that are attracted to the city. Um, and there are also a lot of cities across the country that are starting to pass bird safe building regulations that both take into account lights as well as building buildings to begin with, um, with windows that are safer for birds and less collision prone. So even though high rises and metropolitan cities is definitely a problem, if you look at the numbers of birds that are actually hitting windows, high rise building uh, collisions are actually make up less than 1% of all the collisions across the country. And it's actually the low rise and residential buildings that are uh, the, the, the majority of the problem. And this is simply because High rises are concentrated in a very small geographical area. There's not very many of them compared to other types of buildings. And lower profile buildings are ubiquitous across all kinds of landscapes, even in rural areas. So though you're not getting those mass collision incidents, one to three birds per year on each of these lower buildings adds up to many millions um, over the course of a year. So when you're home and to hear or to witness a collision, it can be quite traumatizing. Um, I know, I'm sure, has, does anybody, has anybody had an issue with a window collision in their recent memory? Yeah, it happens and it happens a lot. Um, so when, when there is a collision, sometimes you will see evidence of it, like um, with a dust print, or a feather left on a window, or maybe even a dead or injured bird. Um, however, um, evidence from various studies actually have found that 25 to 50% of collisions go undetected or leave no evidence. So of all the ones that you notice, there may be another one that you didn't notice, unfortunately. Um, so the common suggestion, if you have found an injured bird, the common suggestion for helping an injured bird was to put it in a shoebox or to put it in a dark place, leave it for about an hour, let it sort of get its wits together. And if it's able to fly off, it's fine. Um, unfortunately, studies also suggest that between 50 and 75% of birds that hit a window do end up dying, whether that is initial in, immediately after the fact or days later. Um, birds are really good at hiding their injuries. So, um, so oftentimes they'll act fine, they'll be able to fly away, but oftentimes they are, have still sustained eye trauma or concussions or other physical injuries that um, affect their ability to forage or regulate their body temperature, which often leads to death a few days later. Um, and wildlife hospitals can help with this. Um, they can um, help with fluids or anti-inflammatories, pain management, um, food, you know, helping them with their nutrition. Um, but there are some cases where it's the, the bird, unfortunately, is too injured to be helped. So uh, moral of the story with this is if you do have a, a window collision, it's always good to just call your local wildlife uh, rehabber and get their advice. All right. That's all I have about the bad news. Are there any questions um, I have? Oh, hold on. Where's my chat? There's my chat. Mary Ellis has her hand up. So Mary Ellis. I was just going to ask, um, I have probably 
four collisions a year mm -hmm. and most of those seem to survive but i didn't didn't know about 50 percent of them probably don't do they end up dying somewhere in the area where <clears throat> you'd find them or do they die they run off <clears throat> and die someplace else I mean, they probably die somewhere in the area, but but we we just recently conducted a um, um, a carcass persistence study, where we um, <coughs> where we planted some bird carcasses for our bird collision monitors to find, and we found that dead birds are notoriously difficult to find, even when they're out in the open. There's just something about, you know, when a bird is alive, they're flitting around, they're moving, there's constant movement and energy about them, that when a something this big that is meant to camouflage into the habitat dies, they're very good at camouflaging into the habitat. So it is likely that they're there and they're just, you're just not finding them. Lori has a question too, has her hand up. Where'd she go, Lori? No, sorry, that was a mistake. I don't have a question. Okay, okay. well, that was easy. And then in the chat, Becky was wondering about wind yeah. turbines. Wind collisions. turbines, wind turbines make up, so if, you know, in the list of cats being the worst, wind uh, windows being second. Wind turbines are actually pretty far down the list of human related cause of bird death. Um, while, you know, there's still numbers and there's still probably numbers that are too large to feel good about. Um, I can get, I, I don't have that list in front of me at the moment, but I can get that information. But it's in the grand scheme of things in comparison to other ways that birds can die due to human activity, wind turbines actually fall pretty low on the list. Um, but I can get you more information on that. Okay, any other questions before we move on to the, to the good news? Okay, let's do it. Okay, so the good news um, with all this is that window collisions are preventable. A billion birds do not have to die at our windows every single year. So the you know three things that you can do pretty easily, pretty quickly, um, if you don't do anything, do one of these three things. Um, so moving those bird feeders, so moving them really close or popping them out a little bit more, that can help a lot. Um, turning off and shielding your outdoor lights can help a lot, especially between June and October, um, just to help those migrating birds that are flying over in the middle of the night. And then making your windows bird safe. And the cool thing about making your windows bird safe is there's tons of different ways that you can do this. So, um, so I'm gonna talk about lots of different options. We're gonna start with options that are more DIY, things that are more like craft projects that you can do um, probably with stuff that you have already at home or can easily get at your uh, local store. Um, and then we'll also go, we'll also talk about some co commercial methods, some like a little bit more hardcore, um, more permanent type things that you can also do. So there's lots of options in between as well. All right, so these three are the sort of crafty project DIY methods that I like to, um, that I like to promote because they're so easy to do and they're very, very quick. So the, uh, the image on the left, the oil-based window marker, that is a Sharpie that looks like this. It's Sharpie brand. It's an oil-based window marker. You just need this and a yardstick. And um, I drew those lines on my window three inches apart vertically. Um, and then you can add embellishments. I added a few feathers to, uh, to make it pretty, but you can also just have the lines. And it's a thin white line. You barely even notice that it's there. Um, the image in the middle is a soap drawing. So you can take a bar of soap and draw whatever you would like on the outside of your window. Um, you can use, I've done it where you can also do the same thing as the window marker where you just get a, um, a yardstick and measure three inches, three inch uh, vertical lines. Um, or you can get a little artistic with it, draw a design if you would like. 
Um, and then the school glue decals. This is an activity that you can do with children. It's a super fun one. Um, you take some school, some white school glue, a few drops of dish soap and some food coloring and make some paint. And then you just paint designs onto like a, a sheet of plastic, like, um, like you would get a clamshell, like strawberries come in. So something plastic that you can paint on, let it dry and it peels off like a window decal would, and you can just stick it to your windows um, however you'd like. Um, I will say that the soap drawings and the glue decals, if they get wet, they will get a little melty. Um, the oil-based window marker can get wet, no problem, without anything. All three of these can be washed off very easily from your window as well. All right, these three are definitely DIY. You would do this yourself, but they are DIY things that you would purchase the materials for that are specific to, that are specific for um, uh, preventing window collisions. So the first one is the feather friendly window tape on the left. Um, and what that is, that looks like this. It's a very, very thin tape. And, um, and you just, I don't know if you can see that but you'll see that there's quarter inch white stickers attached to this tape in two inch um, intervals. And what you do is you just um, stick, you just put a strip of this tape on your window, um, squish it down with a credit card or just something to make sure that those white things um, stick. And then you peel off the plastic backing. So all you're left with are tiny quarter inch squares of white stickers and you just go you you put one strip across and then you go down two inches and then put another strip across go down two inches another strip across until you cover your whole window um, and some people are like I don't want a bunch of white stickers on my window but it's actually surprisingly easy for your eyes to look beyond them um, and not and and you can it doesn't impact as far as you know, this is my personal anecdote, um, but it doesn't impact your ability to see out your windows in any way. Um, Kaleidoscape tape is the picture in the middle. Similar idea to the Feather Friendly, you just get a roll of tape that looks like this. And it is a clear perforated tape. So it's a clear tape with a bunch of little holes in it. And you do the same thing, you measure two inches horizontally or three inches vertically. And um, you, stick your, you stick your tape on there, it goes up really fast. Um, and once again, it's clear tape, so it doesn't really impact your ability to see out of your window. Um, and then the third one here is the window alert decals. I think decals have been around the longest of all of these. Everybody, you know, it's, you used to be able to get falcon shaped decals or butterfly shaped decals. Um, the issue with the decals is when you buy a set of decals, you often get only four or five with the idea that if you put four or five decals on a window, the birds know it's a window and therefore they don't run into it, um, which is unfortunately not the case. They're still gonna be able to see the, the large spaces in between the decals are still gonna look like spaces where they can fly through. So um, it's often that you'll see decals and then a dust print of a bird right next to one of those decals. So decals still work. You just need to get a lot more of them and place them on your window in a way that you have very little space in between them. So a few tips um, when you are bird safing a window with any of these uh, previously mentioned methods, it's really important to remember that all window treatment methods need to be done on the outsides of your window. Um, the idea, the, the main idea is to break up the reflection on the window. So doing it on the outside is the way to do that. Um, and then the spacing idea. Um, birds know how big their bodies are. And so they know that they can get through pretty small areas. The smaller the bird, the smaller the area they can fly through. Um, so especially those hummingbirds, they know that they can get through lots of tiny spaces. Um, so making sure that you don't have a space any larger than a two inch by two inch area is going to make sure that you um, catch all of those birds so that, so that every single one of them, even the tiniest hummingbird knows that they cannot fly through. Um, so it's two inches in height, four inches in width. I, I like to go three or two inches as far as the vertical lines go. 
And then the last thing is do what works best for you. You don't have to bird safe all of your windows right away. Take your time. You know, you can try out different, different um, methods. That's what I've done. I've sort of done a whole bunch of methods at home to, just to see which one's the easiest to put up, which one do I like the best as far as aesthetics, things like that. Um, and just remember that doing something is better than doing nothing. So don't feel overwhelmed by all of these ideas. Just pick one and try it out. Any questions about these DIY methods before we move on? Mary Alice, I see your hand up. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted. <laughs> the nature shop, is that on your website? Yes, so that's the available? Seattle Audubon nature shop. Yeah, so you, we have an online store, so you can actually buy all of these. You can actually buy the feather friendly, you can buy the kaleidoscape tape, you can buy the decals um, from our online shop. Mm -hmm. um, just go to seattleaudubon.org. Uh, the oil-based Sharpie I got at Staples, I think. Any, um, any office store should have that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on, but you can always ask me questions at the end. Okay, so this is, um, so let's go into a little bit more of the commercial methods. Um, so the Kaleidoscape two by two tape is the same aesthetic as the, um, as the feather friendly. It just comes in much wider rolls of tape. And it's the same idea. It's these wide rolls of tape with a bunch of white dots. You put the tape on, make sure the white dots stick and you peel the backing off. So it's just white dots on your window. Um, it's just a little bit more expensive, but you probably get the job done a little bit faster because of the thicker tape. Um, and I think it's a, it takes a little bit more skill to make sure that to do it straight. Um, the bird screen is another good is another good one that's really quick to put up. You don't have to put anything on your window. Um, you just order these custom screens that are that you can order based on your window size, and then they bring they send you all the hardware, and you just hook you just add some hooks at the top of your window and hook this bird screen up, and boom, you got it. You, you have an instantly bird safe window. Um, the Acopian Bird Savers is um, basically hanging paracord. And this is a really good one that I have found a lot of success with. Um, so the Acopian Bird Savers, you can go to acopianbirdsavers.com, I believe. I'll send you all this information. Um, and you can purchase pre-made ones that you install on your windows, or you can go and purchase a roll of paracord and make them yourself. It's quite easy. You just go to the, you know, the cam a camping store or a support sport supply store and you just buy a roll of paracord. You cut it to the length, the height of your window. And then you buy what's this, this thing, which is called J channel. And it is at your hardware store in the drywall section. And you just drill holes and pull the paracord through. And basically what you're left is with a paracord curtain. And then you just take two screws and screw this into your, into your window frame. And you have a bird friendly window. Um, and this, they, they just hang freely um, so that there's a little bit of movement. So the birds know it's there. Plus the lines, you know, the lines itself know that the birds, that the, let the birds know that there's a window there as well. Um, this is a really great option for second story windows because you're not spending, you're, you're spending minimum, maximum five minutes at each window, just screwing these in to the window frame. So this is a really good option for second story windows because you're not on the ladder for very, very long at all. All right, and then these are sort of the professionally installed methods, which is, um, which is a, uh, an option as well. Um, so the image on the left is actually the Seattle Audubon Nature Shop. Um, this last spring, we commissioned um, an, a local artist, Angelina Villalobos, to 
draw us this beautiful image of a buried thrush, our window collision poster bird. And we had it um, printed on vinyl and professionally installed on our windows. So bird safe windows can be beautiful as well. Um, the middle image is the feather friendly commercial method. So that's this stuff, but there, but the people come out and do it for you. And I'm sure they do it in a way that's much easier than these little strips. Um, and so this one is a really good option for businesses who have lots of windows, or maybe you have um, a larger house with lots of windows that are higher up, that's hard to get to. They can get to all those higher to reach, um, harder to reach windows and they can do your entire house. So it's a great way to just sort of get it done um, and you don't have to worry about your windows being a hazard anymore. Um, same goes with the Solix bird safety films. Same idea, they'll come out and, 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 and install these for you. These safety uh, bird safety films are, um, they come in lots of different, different uh, patterns. So sometimes you can get some birds, you can get flowers, you can get dots, you can get lines. Um, there's lots of options. Um, for, uh, the Solix bird safety film comes with lots of aesthetic options. Um, I see some questions. So yes, this uh, Sharpie is white. I think it also came with other colors too. Um, the feather friendly tape is as permanent as you want it to be. It's a sticker. So it's very easy to just peel it off. I mean, it would probably be a little bit of a pain to peel off a bunch of teeny tiny stickers, but they are not permanent. You can peel them off. Um, replacement of these things. So I think feather friendly, I mean, I've had my feather friendly up for almost two years and it seems perfectly fine. It seems just like the day I put it up. Um, the window decals are the only one that probably will degrade over time. The, the packaging on the decals say you, you might, you will need to replace them every six months, but I've had decals up for a couple of years and it's, they've never been a problem. So um, I think they're, you don't have to do this very often. I haven't had to redo any of my um, stuff other than the soap drawings because the soap drawings wash off with water. All right, and then lastly, there's just a few other bird-friendly measures that not aren't necessarily marketed as bird-friendly, but are still good, like insect screens. I'm sure most of you have insect screens on your window, and they're actually really good at preventing window collisions. Um, the only issue with insect screens is oftentimes you have only half the window covered, so you just need to make sure to do something on the other half. Um, stained glass is another option. I know there's other parts of the country that are really into stained glass. Um, I think less so around here, but any stained glass um, installed on the outside of your window, um, birds can see that really easily. And then the last one I want to talk about is this acid etched glass by Walker Glass. Um, so this is a great opportunity if you are replacing your windows or if there's a new build, you can actually build a building with already, um, already bird safe glass and this is just glass that's been etched with you know acid etched so that you can have dots you can have lines but it's all done on the outside and it's there and it's there permanently um, so that is a good option as well um, screens on the inside no screens on the inside will not work make sure that the only screens on the outside of the window will work mm. all right i think oops, i think that's it so so that those are all of my options um, so three things, uh, three other things that you can do to help us with this bird, um, with this window collision effort. Um, so if you ha have had an instance where a bird hit your window and you have, and you have a story to tell us about it, we would love to hear that story. So we are doing a story collection of folks, um, who had experiences with window collisions. You can go and tell us our story, um, at seattleaudubon.org. Um, bird safing your windows. We just talked about that. And if you do find a dead bird, we would love it if you could report it to dbird.org. That is a community data collection site um, that we that started in uh, New York City, but we've just um, uh, started a uh, an effort to collect local data. And so our uh, conservation manager is keeping a close eye on all the data that comes in around our area through DBIRD. So 
any, um, so whether it's a bird that died from a window collision or died for another reason, or it's a, if a reason that you don't know, that's okay too. Um, if you could just tell us where you found it, um, take a picture of it if you could upload that picture and um, you can help us with our data collection efforts through that. And that's all I have for you, but I am happy to answer any questions that you might have about any of this. So I have a question about hummingbirds getting trapped in skylights. This is not, they're not hitting oh. the skylights and, and dying, uh -huh. but they see the light up above and they want to fly up. And I'm afraid- Is this put, like, a, like a covered porch that has yes, a skylight? Right, ah, right, right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I'm afraid to put a screen on the bottom because I'm mm -hmm. afraid they're going to get caught in the screen. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations? I mean, the, I would. That was my first thought was was putting a screen and just yeah. making sure that that screen is flush against that roof portion. Oh, I was going to put it on the bottom, so I don't know how to put it up against the screen. Yeah, I would. I would. That would be my suggestion is maybe find a way to attach it to so that it's flush. Actually, maybe I can just draw lines on it. You could draw lines, but I don't think, but I think that's a situation where they're attracted to the light and they think they can go yeah. out. Whereas if they, yeah. but the lines will just make it so that if they, they'll just get to the lines and have the same problem of what being stuck okay. in there. All right. Okay. Yeah. I think you want to sort of cover the well so they don't actually end up in the well. Okay. I just didn't want them getting caught in the. Yeah. I think I, if it's flush and there isn't like bits sticking out where they okay. can like, you know, get themselves sort of wedged in anywhere, it'll okay. probably be. All right. Well, I'll figure better. out a way to get it yeah. flush. I don't know. I mean, it's <laughs> curved, so that's going to be difficult, but okay. I'll try. What other questions do we have? People, I know a lot of people have, we have problems with birds, um, even. So sometimes they eat berries and they get drunk. Mm -hmm. So will they still see these things? Is this still effective um, with drunk birds? I bet I I'm my guess is yes. I mean, yes, drunk birds tend to hit windows more. Um, don't, don't drink and fly. Don't drink and fly. Yes. But I think <laughs> I think for the drunk birds, bird safe your windows. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> what other questions do people have? There is this issue. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. There's this issue of robins this time of the year that, and I think as the story goes, they like to come up to a window and get themselves prepared for mating. And they'll oh. fly right up against the window. And mm -hmm. uh, you talk about a mess. And uh, it's not that they're crashing, but is there any way, or let's, let me start with, is that not some kind of a uh, mating? preparation that they're going through and is there a way to defer that other than standing right in front of the window then they fly away mm -hmm. your yeah. comments so the so that is oftentimes males seeing their own reflection and being insulted by another male in their territory so they're actually just trying to fight off another male is oftentimes the issue that's happening so yes it is related to mating um it, you know, that's, it's just, luckily it's just a seasonal thing. So after a few weeks, the, the window of that happening does go away. But um, I think the best thing to do in that situation, um, really, you just have to cover up that window for a little while. Um, you know, it's, you just gotta, and I don't, and I don't know if any of the, like lines, they're still going to see their reflection in between the lines. So I don't think that, um, that these right. collision prevention methods will really help with that necessarily um you know it like i've heard when like birds doing it on your car mirrors or your windshields um and all those situations you know putting a paper bag over it like just taping some paper over it just just at the at the bottom where they're because oftentimes they're sort of sitting on the windowsill and attacking themselves over and over and over again so just sort of taping some paper up outside the window for a couple weeks oftentimes is is enough to uh, help them help them move on. <laughs> I want to add to this. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I went with the same gentleman's issue. 
uh, we have uh, the robins every year, and it is not just two weeks. It's closer to four months. Oh, no. <laughs> and I, I've always heard it was territorial. They have already had their babies, and they're protecting them. Mm. And they come in, and they crash and crash and crash. And, you know, yeah, they, they finally leave but um, at the end of four months. But it's kind of a Yikes. drag. To yeah. it. And it's not just, you know, like the backyard windows. They go around the whole house. <laughs> and it's uh, it's been like years. And it's like they come back and, well, darn. Wow. You have some particularly um, uh, protective male robins. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Pam has a question. But you need to unmute. Yeah. OK. There you yeah. go. I see mute, and I think I'm on mute. So I forget that, that <laughs> it's um, anyway, I'm dyslexic about that. Um, my I do have a window that's been a problem, and I've lost a robin or two because of that. But my window situation is such that it's on the upper story. It's a large window. It's a view window. We have a lot of views here. On, I see the mountains, I see the water, and I don't really want to write things all over the windows. And the windows that are a problem are perpendicular to each other. And I think they see it as a flyway through the corner of my house. Um, so I've been thinking that I could put up a few decals, but I really don't want to compromise the view it's right in the living room area where I would entertain so and and the other windows I don't think are a problem but um I I'm looking there for a solution and I really don't see one I mean yeah it's it, it perpendicular windows most likely it is they, they see it as a flyway um that is a situation where it's the see-throughness of the window not just the reflection yeah yeah um yeah. And so it's, you know, it's, that's just unfortunately one of those things where you just, you know, have to decide what, what's sort of the best compromise that you can make, um, you know, for, cause I, I see that you're pulled in two directions of, I want to help these birds, but I also kind of like my view. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and I think, and I think it's, you know, I would not recommend the paracord because it is a lot of black lines going across your window. Right. Um, I think what I, solution. right. But what I would recommend maybe is like a feather friendly situation, because like I said, the dots are surprisingly easy to look past They're you, they're there and you can see that they're there, but they're, they're, they don't impact your view of the outside world in any way. Um, okay. So that could be that I would recommend that as an option. And if, you know, and if slapping up a couple decals, you, you can always just try that because it's not, it's not difficult to put them up and it's better than nothing. And, um, and you can see how that affects your strike numbers. If you're noticing, you know, if, if you're putting these decals up and you're and the birds still keep coming then maybe you do need to do a little bit more but you may find that putting a few decals up on either side is going to help reduce some of those numbers okay and you they can are, get yeah they're really yeah. large and really high and so I, it's right. not something i could do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what about yeah, putting uh, like difficult. a flag near the windows does that help or do they still i guess not if it, they really need the four inches okay yeah, yeah I and, maybe I could put something on the inside, but now I found out that that I I've there is a product. I'll have to look it up. There is a product that is a UV. I mean, it's they're kind of big stickers, but the idea with those is it's a UV sticker that you can use on the inside of your window, uh -huh. um, specifically for these giant higher to reach windows. The only issue with any UV, because uh, um, the a lot of window decals will say, "Oh, it's UV. Birds can see them." But UV really only works when there's sunlight. Um, on an overcast day, which we have lots of, um, it they don't work as well. So, you, I can I can try to find 
that product. And that is something that you can do on the inside. Okay. Um, it kind of looks holographic a little bit and you just stick it on the window on the inside, which might, it would be better than nothing. And then again, these are windows that face Northwest and Northeast. So mm -hmm. they don't get direct sun. Mm -hmm. uh, but on a sunny day, I think it would still work. Okay. Just the ambient light would, would probably help. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Alice, is your hand um, up or is it left up? Okay. Then, then, um, how, then Becky was wondering how about hanging a plastic sharp shinned hawk? Oh, I guess to help Pam out. Yeah, I mean, you can. You could try it. Better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but th those little dots in that one picture, that looked like it would be um, not so obtrusive. Yeah, I was surprised when I, you know, when I, when we were putting them up, I was like, really, we're going to put a bunch of white dots on our window. <laughs> and then when they went up, I was very pleasantly surprised at how unobtrusive it really was to sort of the wind the function of the window itself that's funny how your eyes can just yeah read out things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what did you end up doing with the majority of your windows i have i sort of uh took the opportunity to try them all out okay. um just because i was like if i'm going to talk about this i want to sure. have personal experience with them so um i think the feather friendly the dots um, is my favorite. I feel like it's the most permanent. Um, it's quite easy to put up. Granted, I have a one story house, so all my windows are easy to get to. Um, so it takes like 45 minutes. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to do a, a large ish window with this. Um, so I have that and I have the paracord on a couple of my windows and I found that to be incredibly easy to just make these and then just pop them up. Um, and they seem to work really well. I have the, the window marker. I did do the decals and the soap, but that's not a long-term solution. So that was more like, hey kids, let's have fun and do this craft project. But then it got replaced with something else. Um, and then this is the role that I'm planning on putting up my bedroom window soon. Um, yeah, so I have lots. <laughs> oh, and I have decals too. I have decals too. Yes, the tape, so the feather friendly dots, uh, you can just wash your window like normal and it doesn't affect them at all. So have they, they've been effective? Yeah, I haven't had, I haven't had a, a strike since. Well, that's a good testimonial. Yeah, <laughs> there's one window in, my, in the front of my house that um, does not have any uh uh prevention methods and uh we did have a bird incident <laughs> a couple weeks ago so that's my next project yeah eventually all my windows are going to get covered so i think catherine used used um like tape uh not tape but ribbon christmas ribbon and put it on her hung it down like your paracord mm -hmm. on uh, on her screen doors and that's a cheap solution that is a cheap solution. Not, that works. not very permanent, but um, easy enough to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a document that lists all the all the um, the methods that I talked about today, as well as a few more. Um, and so I have a one document that lists a whole bunch. And so I will actually send that to Roxy so that she can pass it off to you all, so you can have it. Um, just as it's, I call it a menu. You oh. can pick and choose what works for you. Yeah, I'll send that out to all of the registered participants. And and can we put it on our website with a link? Or do you, do you have a link on your website that we could link to? That's a great question. I will make a link on our website. All right, because that would be, a, I would yeah. rather yeah. put it on your website or put mm -hmm. the link so you can per periodic, Good periodically idea. update it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Okay. totally. So that may take a day or two to get it up. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I can long. do that tomorrow. 
that'd be great. All right, any other questions? Thank you all for coming. We're gonna, our birds are gonna be in good shape now that we're not cutting our trees at the wrong time and we're preventing window strikes. So we're doing what we can as and well as planting native planting. plants. Yes. Yeah. So all good things. Well, thank you very much. This has been a great program. And I like Val says, we've been working, waiting for this program for a yeah. long time. <laughs> well, so now you. we can, yeah, we can also tell our friends and neighbors. Excellent. All right. And feel well, free to send me any additional questions if they come up. Oh, good. All right. Yes, there's your, there's your email. Good. Well, thank you. Okay. Have a great evening. Well, thank you much. Bye. And see you all in March, in April. <laughs> for native plants.